the inside story of our prisons, filmed by the prisoners themselves. I have squatted up. Lord, they squatted up. Their footage reveals what really happened. In our biggest prison riot for 25 years. We hate to keep Birmingham, but live footage, but no bullshit, but live as it's unfolding. The radio messages that captured the panic. I don't know how much longer you're going to keep that next shot yard secure. And how close it came to being overrun. If they'd have got through there, we'd have lost control of the whole jail. The whole jail. I actually thought that I was going to lose my life then. We uncover a wider prison system at breaking point. Violence was daily at every level. You know, on one wing, two wings, all of the wings, there was violence. Three, two, one. Spice in a jail ass. Where inmates seem to freely record their drug use and its effects. It's being spawned again, and this is the way they left me. They left me with that knife. And where some staff even smuggle drugs in through the front door. You just walked into the jail, like walking into a shop. That's how easy it was. A system where prisons are infested. There were rats, there were cockroaches. You've got rats literally in your cell looking at you. You're looking in your cupboard and you've seen a rat looking at you. And unsafe for inmates and officers alike. <laughs> this guy just picked me up, threw me down the stairs, upside down. He's got the keys, man. He's got the keys, man. Is what we have done to a whole category of people fair and just? We're still human beings. To that, the clear answer in my view is no. Tonight on Exposure. Fuck you, no. We ask, are our prisons out of control? The government doesn't have a grip on the system, and there's a cost in blood being paid. In December 2016, HMP Birmingham became the scene of Britain's worst prison riot for 25 years. Inmates and staff say there had been a decline in control for many months before the riot. The last three or four years, there was an erosion of staffing levels, there was high sick levels, so there was never enough staff on duty to be able to run a full regime for prisoners, which created a lot of frustration and a lot of problems. Since 2010, government spending on prisons has been cut by 22%. Despite recent recruitment, there are 25% fewer prison officers than there were eight years ago. It wasn't unusual that we should have been running on six on a wing uh, that we'd be down to three or even two. People just get lawless, you know, and especially when there's not much staff around, you know, to do, to do certain things. Prisoners became emotional terrorists. They would do things that I'd never seen in 20 years. Flicking blood, throwing excrement. You could actually sense it that something isn't right or something going to happen soon, you know, in this prison. Inmates and staff could feel the tension in the air because it was that thick. There was staff being assaulted, whether you're being punched, spat at or potting where prisoners would put urine or excrement in, in a jug or a bowl and then chuck it on you. There's a lot of violence in there stabbings, hot waters, you know what I mean? People regular getting hit, punched. It was just like a time bomb ticking, just ready to go off. All it took was a small
small act of protest. A prisoner who complained he hadn't been able to see the dentist jumped onto the netting and was joined by other prisoners with grievances. A senior officer came to negotiate with one of the protesters. The officer's radio message reveals what happened next. He said to me, I've got a syringe in my pocket as well. I said, that's stupid. There's a kid hiding round the corner. As I'm about to lock the door, my keys wasn't in my hand. He's ripped my keychain and they've just snapped off. Now stolen, the senior officer's keys could give access to many areas of the prison, including doors to the outside. It was around within seconds, literally round the jail, that yes, they had got keys. And it, it scared the life out of me, to be honest. Suddenly, you're in uh, massive danger, potentially life-threatening danger. As prison officers withdrew, rioters took control of two wings. Hundreds of prisoners' cells were unlocked. They are out on the exercise yard of November Papawing over. The rioters crossed the exercise yard to two other wings where they unlocked more prisoners. P wing unlocked, N wing unlocked, Mike wing unlocked, and it's just the final wing is L wing. Up to 600 prisoners were now on the loose, and some of them were broadcasting live on social media. I can remember seeing hordes of prisoners running around. They sent a shockwave through the prison. A phys it was a physical shock throughout the prison. I saw some riot police actually running away. You could see staff were genuinely scared. You could see the fear in the face from, from everybody. Because the potential now for you to lose the jail was as real as it was going to get. The rioters ran towards a gate, which would give them access to the rest of the prison. I don't know how much longer you're going to keep that, that exercise yard secure. We need to get chains immediately on the outside gates from the exercise yard. That's immediate over. If that gate was opened partially or chained or, and they attacked it, it wouldn't have held. It would not have held. And staff would have got slaughtered, basically. You can't have 20 staff, 30 staff, containing 600 men. Just one gate kept the rioters from taking over the prison. If they'd have got through there, and it literally was that gate holding them, and if those immensely brave men and women hadn't held that, we'd have lost control of the whole jail. The whole jail. We've got uh, quite a severe smoke coming out of November. By early evening, there were several fires both inside and outside the blocks. HMP Birmingham got live footage, but no bullshit, but live as it's unfolding. Everything that can catch fire at that point, people setting it on fire. Prisoners have really lit a fire. Um, Gate. Some inmate pulled two mattress to my door and lit it. I start crying, you know, start beating on the door for help, someone to help me, you know, but there was no one. How could you evacuate uh, a wing that's on fire in the middle of a riot? I actually thought that I was going to lose my life then. I wasn't going to be around no more. Riot control squads known as tornado teams were called in from around the country. 
It wasn't until 8.35 in the evening that they were able to attempt to regain control of the wings using stun grenades. I think about 9, 10 o'clock, I heard a lot of flashbangs, and I think that's when they can save me. At 10 p.m., 14 hours after the protest started, tornado teams finally secured the jail. During the riot, photographs taken by prisoners had been widely circulated in the media. The film is such to put on social media so that they make the public aware that the way them is being treated in the prison because nobody else is hearing them. In the aftermath, the questions began. How could this happen? It's very simple, really. If you take 40% out of the budget, if you cut staff by 30%, if you increase your prisoner numbers, you're creating a recipe for disaster. It just so happens the disaster on this occasion landed on Birmingham's doorstep. The government commissioned a report into the riot, but has said that it's not appropriate to release any part of it because it could compromise security arrangements. However, Exposure has learned that a redacted copy of the report was made available to prisoners charged with rioting during their trial. Of course, an analysis should be published of what happened at Birmingham. But also, it's important that lessons are learnt. If things are hidden, that will mean that the right solutions aren't put in place. Exposure has obtained a copy of the report. It says although sufficient staff were available on the day, the riot could and should have been prevented, and that staff had, in the preceding year, become worn down by chronic staffing shortages. It says staff had gradually relinquished authority to the prisoners, who were, in effect, policing themselves for much of the time. If staff have withdrawn, when I say withdrawn, withdrawn, not physically, would have withdrawn because they're not confident, then this is the kind of recipe for disturbances in prisons. G4S, who run HMP Birmingham, told us that the riot was very challenging and said... Our dedicated officers faced determined aggression with incredible courage, resilience and professionalism. Their brave actions helped to prevent further disruption. They say there were lessons to be learned and the prison has undergone a number of significant changes, including the strengthening of security measures. However, the confidential report we've obtained also concluded that the encroachment on safety and decency and the risks of disorder are not peculiar to Birmingham. Just a month earlier, this was the scene at HMP Bedford, where rioting prisoners flooded the gangways. The prisoners stuck notes on the walls of A-Wing, saying, this was caused by 23-hour lockup, and we need to be treated like human beings. A report on HMP Bedford revealed that one week before the riot, just 55 officers were working at the prison. Half what is needed to run a full regime. There were also disturbances in this prison at Swaleside in Kent, Lewis, Hull, and here. at the Mount in Hertfordshire. Fucking hell. All right, they're squatted up. Blood! They're squatted up! The government doesn't publish figures for the numbers of these events. But using freedom of information, we've established that tornado teams like the ones shown here were deployed in 23 separate serious incidents last year. The increase in the incidence of riots uh, is a clear indication that prisoners are in a state of chaos. The basic issue 
is taking nearly a quarter of the funding out while keeping the workload the same is simply undoable. And the government should have known that that was uh, a risk, a bridge too far. One of the factors increasing widespread disorder is the prevalence of drugs, including new psychoactive substances such as spice and mamba. There's no doubt that psychoactive substances have been a destabilizing factor. But the key issue here is the trade in the drugs, because you can sell a psychoactive substance in a prison for about 10 times the cost of buying it on the street. You can make a lot of money smuggling in psychoactive substances. And if you can make a lot of money, there's going to be a lot of debt. And if there's going to be a lot of debt, there's going to be a lot of violence. And there's no doubt that the trade in drugs is contributing to the violence in prisons. Price. I don't think it's just one cost. The drug situation is for people just to forget about where they are. And that's what they're taking the drugs for. Just to forget about everything because... There's nothing for him. There's nothing for him. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to roll me a joint, take some spice. Boom. Forget about it, the whole prison. Forget about food, eating, because I'm not getting enough food. I'm out cold. No one cares about me. You don't care about me. They don't care about me. So why should I care about myself? Some people selling all the canteen, selling clothes, trainers. Selling the Sunday dinner, saying, oh, if you give me um, this amount of spice, I'll give you my, my chicken dinner kind of thing. You sell anything, really, just for spice. David Gork is the new Justice Secretary, the sixth in eight years. He says tackling drug use in prison is part of his government's policy of what they call getting the basics right. For prisons to be effective, we must get the basics right. Getting the basics right means priority to prevent drugs, mobile phones, and other contraband from getting in. I just need to make it. Videos on social media, many of them unverified, appear to show prison drug abuse and are so prevalent that even the Secretary of State has felt the need to comment on them. Let's see that much. A prisoner climbing into a tumble dryer in the prison laundry room. A dangerous act of humiliation. One, two, three, two, one. Two naked prisoners believing they are dogs with makeshift muzzles and leads around their necks, barking at and fighting each other. Big lungs, big lungs, big lungs, big lungs. Oh, man! Inmates sometimes find it funny to see how, like, inmate reacting after they take the drugs and that. But afterwards, they realise that this is not something for us to take lightly, you know? People is dying from it, and this is the reality about, you know, this mamba spice, or what they call it. It's pretty easy to get hold of uh, spice, weed, heroin, gear, um, anything. Um, prison. Spice in a jail ass. Videos of people on drugs in, in, in prison going onto social media is just a um, class case of the prison of lost control. He's got this, he's got this in the bag. He's got this in the bag. They use lab rats like or mamba challenges they give to people. So the, the choice, see if it's any good. If it is, them on the floor, doing all the business, they get filmed. You know what I mean? They get laughed at. And then the, the drugs look good for them, then they'll, they'll sell it. It's a bomb. <laughs> this video appears to show the humiliation oh, of one bomb. drugs prisoner, bomb. making him think an apple is a bomb. Whoa! Uh, the bomb! The bomb! <laughs> and another appears to show a prisoner made to believe his throat has been cut. The number of ambulances increased wildly because of the mamba use. I mean, there's people flaking out here, there, and everywhere. We call them mambulances, and they come regular. 
Exposure has discovered that over the last five years, the number of ambulances attending calls from prisons in England has jumped by 60%. In 2017, more than 10,000 were called out to attend incidents in prisons. My view is that much more needs to be done to keep these drugs out of our jails because they are having a devastating impact uh, on, on the lives of prisoners. G4S says it has no tolerance for drug use at Birmingham prison and anyone bringing in drugs will face disciplinary action or be prosecuted. Between June 2013 and September 2016, 79 deaths in prisons were linked to psychoactive drugs. So how do these drugs get into our jails? Next, we hear from a prison officer who smuggled them in through the front door. You just walked into the jail, like walking into a shop. That's how easy it was. Two hundred and twenty-five kilograms of illicit drugs were recovered from prisons in England and Wales in 2016. So how do they get in? Sometimes it's just simply the packages are being thrown over the walls. Sometimes we've heard about drones being used to bring drugs in. Sometimes they're being smuggled in through visitors. Other times it's undoubtedly the case that staff corruption has played a role. Exposure has investigated the case of a corrupt officer. We interviewed him before he started a prison sentence for smuggling a psychoactive drug into jail. He's asked us to protect his identity, so we aren't naming the prison where he worked, and his words are spoken by an actor. I've got to make it clear about myself. I've done the crime, and I accept everything about it. I'm ashamed to know that all the experience I've got, I still allow myself to be put in this position. Before he joined the prison service, this officer had a history of addiction and a criminal record. But the prison service did not pick this up until six years later. The management came round and said that everyone had to be re-vetted for the job. After working at the prison for six years, I was sacked. After he was dismissed by Serco, the company running the prison, the officer appealed and the prison service reinstated him. He says that he was then intimidated by prisoners. If they saw someone who was vulnerable, they'd jump on them. And I was one of those people. I was vulnerable. You've got new, naive, vulnerable staff coming into prison who are ripe for corruption. Um, and the reward package isn't as good as it used to be for prison officers. So they could be vulnerable to being corrupted. Criminals paid the officer several thousand pounds to smuggle drugs into the prison. He says he wasn't searched on any of the occasions he brought drugs in. As long as you had your uniform and your badge on, you just walked into the jail, like walking into a shop. That's how easy it was. Exposure has obtained a witness statement made by a senior officer in charge of security at the same prison. He says that there were more than 300 separate drug fines over the last year. He also says... With specific regard to staff who choose to bring drugs into the prison, they are not likely to be strip-searched and are likely to choose means such as hiding drugs in their own clothing. I mean, actually, if staff know they aren't, they're not going to be searched, that increases the risk they'll be tempted to bring something in that they shouldn't. And one of the ways you prevent it is you have searches, you have them regularly, and you have them at unpredictable times. The security officer's statement also says... Staff searches are currently randomly conducted, but opportunity still exists for staff to smuggle items in, and there is the potential for significant financial gain. Anyone who worked at the prison, not just officers, they could take the gamble and just walk in with anything. The officer was never caught in the act of smuggling drugs, but when an informant tipped off staff, he was questioned and admitted what he'd done. He says staff who are compromised need to be helped. We know staff bring contraband into prisons. I should imagine within the prison service there are a few hundred people that are being conditioned, even already brought drugs in, and they don't know what to do. 
if you had an amnesty and said to everybody that's in trouble, you come forward and we'll help you out of here. I believe that would help the drugs, but they are in prison at the minute. The prison's inspectorate said that in the jail where he worked, drugs, particularly spice, were readily available. And that measures to reduce the supply of drugs there were inadequate. The company that runs the prison, Serco, told us... Serco is working hard to detect and stop the illegal smuggling of contraband into the prison using a mix of new technology, personal searches and dogs. We are having increased success in doing so and we will always work with the police to bring a prosecution. The Ministry of Justice said they couldn't give us figures for the number of prison officers convicted of smuggling contraband into prison in the last five years. I think there is something about the fact, obviously, that what happens in prisons is by definition behind the wall and it's out of public view. Uh, and you know, let's be honest, uh, the plight of prisoners isn't necessarily at the top list of the public's uh, concerns. Getting the basics right means creating prisons that are decent, with clean wings and humane living conditions. Peter Clark recently asked the government to take action over the conditions he found at HMP Liverpool. People were being held in utterly appalling and unacceptable conditions, uh, and there didn't seem to be any plan uh, in place to improve this. Cells were filthy, they were damp, they were dark, lavatories were blocked, there were rats, there were cockroaches. When the lights went out at night, the cockroaches came in underneath the cell door, came up through the drains, uh, the plug holes. There'd be several trapped in the sink or dead in the toilet. The same goes for the rats. You've got rats literally in your cell looking at you. You're looking in your clothes cupboard and you've seen a rat looking at you. Like, wow, what am I supposed to do next? You've got damp conditions. You've got horrendous conditions to live in. But you've got to make that your home. Critics say the lack of investment also impacts on the rate of reoffending, which costs an estimated £15 billion a year. Nearly half of adults are reconvicted within one year of release. We send people to prison as punishment, not for punishment. If we treat people in a degrading and humiliating way while they're in prison, we know that doesn't make them better, that makes them worse. Uh, what we ought to be saying to prisoners is, look, you, you, you can be a different person. You, you, you don't, you have to stop seeing yourself simply as a criminal, but start seeing yourself as a citizen who can put something back into society. You don't do that if you keep people in conditions you wouldn't keep a dog in. Controlling drug use and improving prison conditions are two of the basics that critics say the government needs to get right. But there is another, controlling violence. Getting the basics right means creating prisons that are safe, free from violence, intimidation and self-harm. Violence in our prisons is at record levels. Last year, there were more than 20,000 assaults on prisoners, a record high and up 9% on the year before. I'm on a beach, yeah? Shut up, shut up, I'm stabbing you. Also, there were more than 7,000 assaults on staff, 22% up on the previous year. The increase in assaults are the key things that are making prisons very difficult to run, worse for prisoners, dangerous for staff. Get ready to hold it. Assaults uh, between prisoners, prisoner and prisoner assaults, have about doubled since 2010. Assaults on staff have tripled. And actually, because there are less staff, the incident, the risk for staff has quadrupled, gone up four times. That's an incredible increase. And because the risk of staff being assaulted is high, that makes staff very wary of confronting prisoners. Bradley Newton worked as a prison officer for 27 years at HMP Cardiff. He says that after staffing cuts in 2010, the atmosphere in prison changed. You could feel the tension every day that hadn't been there before. 
The noise level was rising. In April 2016, he was working on a fourth floor landing when he challenged a prisoner who was new to the wing and had taken another prisoner's lunch. He was like six foot six, solid, very, very strong. And the next minute, this guy had just picked me up while I've got the lock on him, threw me down the stairs, upside down. Seemingly, I hit the back left-hand side of my head on the metal kickboard. It's like a metal skirting board about five inches high. I was in a lot of pain. I'd been told by the member of the care team that when he arrived up the stairs off, uh, to, in response to the alarm bell, that he thought I was dead. He suffered serious head injuries. I have no short-term memory left whatsoever. I suffer from violent headaches more or less every day, sometimes two, three days on the trot. I have vivid, horrible nightmares where I'm fighting in my sleep all the time. I've actually hit my partner twice in, in the, during these nightmares where I'm fighting. It's not just my life, it's my family's life has been totally turned upside down. And the prison, prison service don't care. Bradley Newton had worked in the prison service for 30 years. He hoped it would look after him. I received a letter from the governor of Cardiff Prison asking me to attend a capability hearing. He said, I'll have to go buy your record. He said, nobody's got a bad word to say about you. You've done 30 years in the prison service. That's half your life. I said, yeah, I know it is. And then he went, quick as a flash, are you coming back to work in the next month without going sick? I said, Governor, at the moment, I cannot go near the jail. And he said, well, in that case, I'm dismissing you for medical inefficiency. He said, your pension will stop from today, your lump sum will stop today. The prisoner was convicted of assaulting Newton. Before the assault, he had been confined to a segregation unit for making threats. He had also previously assaulted another prison officer. He should never have ever been anywhere near the normal location because of his history of violence, attacking staff. Not only that, I was never told he was on the landing, otherwise I would have dealt with him differently. The Ministry of Justice declined to comment on this case. I'm really, really angry that I cannot go and work in the prison anymore because of my, my mind and my mental state. I'm angry that I probably won't work anymore in my life. But being sacked for doing my job to the best of my ability and being assaulted by a very, very violent person who they knew was violent, they knew his history, I think they've got a lot to answer for the government in the way that uh, prisons are run, the way that prisons are inadequately staffed. They don't care. We're just a number to them. My number was CF174. That's it. They do not care. We're nowhere close to the murder of a prison officer because there have been a number of cases of attempt murders of prison officers where uh, prisoners have been charged with that offence brutal assaults, often with weapons, unprovoked, something that didn't used to happen. I hope it doesn't take a murder of prison staff before the problems are taken seriously uh, by the government. 295 people died in prison last year. 70 of those deaths were self-inflicted. Time and again, we know very well that the early days in custody, soon after people go into a jail, uh, that's when they're, they're particularly vulnerable and can be feeling particularly depressed. Uh, we see that a lot of deaths and self-harm occur at this time. 18-year-old Osvaldos Pagiris was arrested for stealing a bag of sweets in 2016. 
he was found to be the subject of a European arrest warrant for a minor theft. The police assessed him as a high risk of suicide in need of constant supervision. He was put on remand in HMP Wandsworth. I saw the young chap on a wing. He looked lost in his eyes. He was a very nice lad. He's uh, a very young lad. He shouldn't have been in prison. He's a very young lad, you can see it. But what I've known of him, just wanted to just phone his mum, tell his mum where, where he was. Pagiris was found attempting to kill himself with a ligature around his neck on five occasions before he was placed inside this segregation unit. Each cell has a bell and light that the prisoner can activate when they need assistance. At 1pm, the camera records this light flashing outside Pagiris's cell as he rings his bell. Well, every cell uh, has an emergency uh, call bell. Uh, and we as an inspectorate say that we think uh, when a prisoner rings that bell, it should be answered within five minutes. HMP Wandsworth had previously been criticised by prison inspectors for long delays in answering bells. Prisons have not implemented fully the recommendations and uh, you know, the price that is being paid is that people are taking their own lives in some jails at uh, horrifying levels. As Pagiris was a suicide risk, he should have been checked every hour. But for 15 minutes after he first rang his bell, this officer stayed in her office on the segregation wing, apparently watching television. She says that the bell was quiet and she didn't hear it. At other times, I've seen with my own eyes bells ringing uh, on wings uh, and significant numbers of prison officers in the wing office not responding to them. The officer goes with a colleague to the cell next door to Bagiris, but appears not to notice the flashing light outside his cell. It's possible to see that uh, where tragedies have occurred and people have been found to have taken their own life in a cell, that actually they had been ringing their bell and, and it had gone unanswered before their, before their death occurred. It is a full 37 minutes after Pagiris pressed his emergency bell that the same officer walks to his cell. When she finally gets there, she finds that he has a ligature around his neck. Aged just 18, he has hanged himself. He was a nice lad. He just wanted to fit in. That's all he could have done. He was trying to fit in. And then next bit I know he's gone. There were 10 self-inflicted deaths in HMP Wandsworth alone between 2014 and 2016. What really concerns us is when we find that there are repeated uh, instances of suicide in particular jails. The Ministry of Justice declined to comment on this case. Coming up, prisons are full, yet some prisoners who have served their minimum sentence still have no idea when they will be released. My name's Michael Frisby. I got given a two-year, nine-month sentence, and yet I've doubled that more so. Gemma Presley has had to get used to waiting. Her boyfriend Michael is in prison and has no way of knowing when he might be released. When he told me that he didn't have a release date, I was like, what? But then obviously I was intrigued. I started looking up the IPP 
and I was just like, wow. The Imprisonment for Public Protection, or IPP sentence, includes a minimum sentence that the offender must serve in prison. Once that expires, offenders have to stay in jail indefinitely until they can convince the parole board they no longer pose a risk. To him, every day is the same day. He can't picture a future. To him, everyday life is locked behind his door. Out for a few hours, locked again, new day. Presley was convicted of GBH in 2012 and given an IPP sentence because he had a previous record. He completed his minimum sentence in 2015, but three years later, he's still locked up. I got given a two year, nine month sentence. Yeah, I'll double that more so. When Presley was turned down for release for the third time by the parole board, he decided to make a stand. My name is Michael Presley. I uh, absconded from his release spring door last night. Fully good reasons why. One is the IPP sentence. The sentence is a disgrace. You took me away from my daughter, my family, Every single person I loved, they got taken away from me. We're still human beings. Give us a chance, and we will be better. You don't give us a chance, you lose hope. The government abolished IPP sentences in 2012, but not retrospectively. So there are still more than 3,000 IPP prisoners like Presley who do not know when they will be released. Critics say this contributes to growing tension in jails. You have a group of prisoners who feel very frustrated about what's happening to them. For the IPP prisoners with very short tariffs, sometimes of just a few months, uh, that remain in prison, I think the risk test should be reversed for them. So it's the system has to show they are still dangerous, rather than the prisoner have to show that they're safe. Some of these men, it is mainly men, have been in prison years and years now, beyond the time that the judge said they needed to serve as punishment, and I think that's unjust. Presley is now back in prison, but he is allowed to call Gemma for a few minutes a day. Well, your video, obviously, that was a good thing to do, because you got your voice out. There's a new Justice Secretary, David Cork. He needs to do something about it. He's the person that can do it. I've yeah. written to him. He has not replied. By serving your sentence and conforming to the rules, you are repaying your debt to society. If you do that, you will find that the state and the prison system backing you up. I think it's very difficult to see that the government will be prepared to do anything their indications to date have been, no, they don't want to. Uh, I hope they will change their minds. I think you have to go back and ask yourself the question, with the benefit of hindsight, is what we have done to a whole category of people fair and just? And to that, the clear answer, in my view, is no. HMP Dovegate. Daniel Sayce has been a prisoner here since last November but he has spent a lot longer in jail because he is an IPP prisoner. In 2006, at the age of 18, Daniel Sace was convicted of stealing £1.55 pence and threatening another victim with a broken bottle. He was given an IPP sentence because of his previous convictions. His minimum sentence was 14 and a half months. But the indeterminate part of his sentence has kept him in prison for 12 years. He is now 30. Today, Daniel Sace is calling a lawyer from prison. Mentally, no light end of the tunnel, just trapped, frustrated, angry at the system, and no one's there looking into my case properly and it's just not taking nothing on board what I'm saying. That's how I feel on it every day. Before Daniel says can be released, he must convince the parole board that he is no longer a risk. 
he might be able to do that by completing rehabilitation courses. But he is assessed as having too low an IQ for such courses. And so he is trapped. There is one kind of person to whom I think special attention should be given, the person who has learning difficulties. What we have to do is to appreciate that that sort of person requires more resource to enable him or her to pass that threshold for release. Why, because we made a mistake, should we not make it easier for such a person to be released? I think there is no answer to that question other than to say we should do all we can. My grandparents, obviously they're old in age and on the halfway up and down all the time. So I might not make it the time I, the time I get out here because of the half condition of it. Okay. Obviously heartbroken and it does it. Say says that before he moved to Dovegate, he lost one of his friends, a fellow IPP prisoner. Obviously I had a close pal here who's an IPP prisoner himself and obviously he lost hope in the system, basically hung himself. We know that rates of self-harm and other indicators of despair amongst IPP prisoners are higher than for the prison population as a whole. And it's about the uncertainty that they don't know uh, uh, when they're going to get out. And obviously, that touched me on it. Obviously, the, 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 the system not really caring if they don't care about IPP prisoners and that. The sentence was a mistake. And therefore, it is important that the government seriously looks again at finding a way of putting right the mistake that we made in 2003 and which has had such a profound adverse effect on so many people. The Ministry of Justice told us it has an action plan for IPPs and that last year, the Parole Board released nearly half of the IPP cases it considered. The Ministry also told us Prisons should be safe places where criminals can reform, and our dedicated prison officers do a fantastic job in often difficult circumstances. But clearly there are challenges that the system and individual prisons face, which is why the government is taking firm action. We passed our target to recruit an additional 2,500 prison officers seven months early, and are investing in new technology and 300 specialist sniffer dogs to stem the flow of drugs and mobile phones into prisons. There is more to be done, but we are committed to making sure prison officers can focus their efforts on turning around offenders' lives. H&P Birmingham, live footage. Life in prison from the public, let me now tell you this now. It's a hell upon hell. Some of the people upstairs need to come down to one of the prisons for one night. Just let's sleep in a prison just one night and see. And then I'll tell you now, they will make sure that everybody gets the facilities. It's not hot, it's not nice. Last month, the prisons minister said that he was determined to create the best prison service in the world. Yet England and Wales still have the highest rate of imprisonment in Western Europe. Nearly one in ten prisons are in special measures. In my view, prisons are in crisis. Violence continues to increase. But with so much violence, particularly assaults on staff, prisons are not under proper control and the risk of further riots must be substantial. Fuck you know. I don't think the government fully realises the gravity of the situation they're in and the need for decisive action. They're dabbling at it at the moment. And there's a cost in blood being paid. Hello.